The Tom Woods Show, episode 591. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. Benefit from my inside information. I happen to know that the good folks at Rocket Languages, whose courses teach you foreign languages on the go, are having a 60% off sale this Friday, February 12th, 2016. Save the date and check it out at TomWoods.com slash rocket. Welcome, everybody. We're talking about the presidents today, and we're joined by the author of a brand new book on the presidents. And the book is called Nine Presidents Who Screwed Up America and Four Who Tried to Save Her. The author, Brian McClanahan, who's been a guest on this program in the past more than once. Brian holds a PhD in history from the University of South Carolina. He's the author of several other books, including The Founding Father's Guide to the Constitution, the Politically Incorrect Guide to the Founding Fathers, and The Politically Incorrect Guide to Real American Heroes. He also co-authored the book Forgotten Conservatives in American History with Clyde Wilson. Brian, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Tom. Appreciate it. All right. You got this great new book. I just gave everybody the super long title and subtitle. And, uh, okay, what made you decide the presidents have to be talked about. Have we talked about the presidents enough? Well, no. I think that we haven't talked about them enough, at least in the way I talk about them in the book. And the the idea that I followed, it actually was born out of my 2012, The Founding Fathers Guide to the Constitution. When I was doing the interviews for that, I made a statement that every president in the last hundred years, virtually every president, should have been impeached. And people were shocked by that. In fact, I was on with G. Gordon Liddy, and he got a good laugh out of that. And he said, well, I agree. <laughs> so... Uh, but that was one thing that people were trying to key in on. And I said, well, you know, I need to write something that would explain why I would say that. And the yardstick I used by which to measure the presidents is how they defended their oath, which is to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. And this has really never been done before in this kind of way. Every, it's been piecemealed. But so what I wanted to do was look at all the presidents and say, okay, we've got Barack Obama, who's awful. We, we all agree with that. But how did, it, how did he get here? And where did all that come from? And so I trace executive abuse essentially from the first administration to the Obama administration. And I pick the, the title says nine, but there's actually 13 presidents in there who did a very bad job, at least according to their oath. And then I put four in uh, who I thought did a really good job, according to their oath. And uh, some of these people in the four are not really household names. Now, our, you know, your listeners are going to recognize, you know, Grover Cleveland and Calvin Coolidge. Uh, and but the person that I said is the greatest president in American history is John Tyler, uh, so maybe not a household name. And then on the other side, again, your your listeners are very savvy, so they're going to get them. But, you know, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln's in that group and Wilson and uh, Teddy Roosevelt, FDR, Truman, Johnson, Nixon, of course, the last four. Uh, but then also uh, Andrew Jackson and uh, George Washington, who does not escape a, a little critique as well. So uh, I wanted to have this comprehensive look at the executive branch and where it's gone off the rails and maybe what we could do about it, I'll offer a chapter on that as well. So it was a lot of fun to write, and um, I, I think it's, it's going to be uh, maybe surprising to, uh, to the mainstream reader, uh, and also maybe a few surprises in there for, for your readers and listeners as well. Well, no doubt. It's, it's really well done. It's actually longer than the typical Regnery book. There's really a lot of, of meat in here. I, I know that when I've worked with Regnery, they always want me to make my book shorter. So I was glad they gave you the space to, to do what you want to do. And, you know, the other day they, they sent me a proposal for a book that would be such a big hit and I think would sell like crazy, and I just, I had to tell them no. I, I have too much going on right now, and I may be doing, I, it looks like I'm doing a different book with somebody else, but, oh, darn it. So anyway, good for you being out there with, with Regnery. They'll, they'll help get the word out about this, and of course, we want to get the word out here on the show. I'm looking at the table of contents, though, right now, just to remind me about the presidents. I, I kind of knew which nine <laughs> you, know, you were going to choose here, uh, or as you say, 13, ultimately. Uh, I don't want to make it too easy on you by giving you Abraham Lincoln. You know, that is just <laughs> – you're, you're prepared for that. you got your talking points. Not going to happen. People have to read that for themselves. And they hear too much from me about, uh, about Teddy Roosevelt. So pick another one of these nine and explain to me why it is that you're choosing somebody, with the exception of Richard Nixon, somebody who is revered, revered by the textbook authors. And you are saying not only should we not revere the person – we should condemn this person. 
Right. Well, I think the really fun one, and now you, you, you said no Lincoln, and every interview I've done on this book so far, everyone's asked me about Lincoln. So it's refreshing. That's why we're not <laughs> yes, doing it here. <laughs> not, to, not to answer Lincoln. <laughs> so the one that people just, they, it's like they're avoiding it like the plague, is George Washington. Now, oh, have, let's talk about George Washington then. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, so George Washington. Now, I admire George Washington. He is the indispensable man. He's he's the greatest American in in, in American history, in my estimation. I've written about him in other books. Uh, I think he's a real American hero. He is one of the greatest of the founding generation, if not the greatest. But as president, he did a couple of things that were wrong. And I think, again, I, I did this, and I'm going to take the sacred cows to task when we need to do it. Uh, and Washington was one of those guys. So the two things that Washington did, now you can blame Hamilton for this too, because Hamilton was in Washington's ear all the time. But the two things he did was his response to the Whiskey Rebellion and a neutrality proclamation. So the response to the Whiskey Rebellion, you know, you had, of course, famously, you had this, this uh, tax revolt on the frontier, and these Pennsylvania farmers weren't going to pay the taxes, which uh, what most people don't realize is that that tax that they were, re- that they re- were rebelling against had already been repealed, so there was going to be no tax anyways. But they're, they're, they're in rebellion against this tax. They're, you know, they're, they're going after tax collectors, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, Hamilton insists that the, the army be marched into Pennsylvania to put down this revolt, this tax revolt. And uh, what's really funny about that is when they show up, of course, there's nobody there, but the real part that's the constitutional controversy is that they had no permission from the state of Pennsylvania to do this. The governor of the state, Thomas Mifflin, who was actually part of the entire ratification and drafting process of the Constitution, uh, said did not give them permission to enter the state. The legislature did not give them permission to enter the state. And as per the Constitution, you need permission from a state to march the army into the state to put down a quote-unquote rebellion. And that's the justification they were using. So Washington was violating the Constitution at Hamilton's request in doing this. Now, as far as the neutrality proclamation, uh, here you have a situation where Washington, uh, we would all agree with the move here not to try to get the United States involved in a war with France or Great Britain, but he does it unilaterally. He just says, look, we're going to be neutral. And Madison takes him to task uh, for this. Uh, Of course, there's a very famous pacificus Helvidius debates where they go over this issue, Madison and Hamilton. And essentially, Madison says, look, there's no power in the Constitution, the executive branch, that where you can issue a unilateral proclamation to say that we're going to be neutral and we're going to stay out of war. This is Congress's job to do. Congress declares war, and by default, they also determine peace. The president can't do it by themselves. So Washington was doing two things here that I think you can see the trace elements of this as we move forward and say Andrew Jackson or Abraham Lincoln or any of the proclamations that have been issued in the last, say, 200 years almost now uh, that, that have been issued by the executive branch. Madison would say they're all unconstitutional. And, of course, according to original Constitution, he's exactly right. So uh, Washington is one of these uh, people that uh, should be criticized for what he did, and he often gets a free pass. All right. That is a surprise. Uh, Well, it's not a surprise to me or to a lot of the listeners, but that's – that would be a third rail. You would not say anything negative about George Washington. But – and I happen to agree with you, by the way, and I'm not one to – I don't worship politicians. I don't hold them in in, – in, I don't have superstitious reverence for them. But I do think that it is historically noteworthy, and people noted at the time, that Washington did not establish a military dictatorship after the war was over. And, and the fact that he relinquished uh, authority, in effect, uh, twice, uh, first after the war and then second at the end of his presidency, these are unusual things in the history of the world, and I think anybody needs to acknowledge that. But this gets taken to a creepy, weird, idolatrous extreme uh, in uh, probably not just in U.S. history, but in the history of all different countries where we hold these people up as if they they are uh, completely perfect when, of course, they're not and we shouldn't expect them to be. All right, let, now let's stick to the, the ones that I see – in your table of contents. Now, did Regnery have any image, to be honest with me now, let's let's talk about this. Did Regnery, the publisher, have any input into presidents that had to be chosen? Like, for example, did they say to you, Obama has got to be one of them? No, they didn't say that, but I think it was assumed that he would be in there. Uh, but they actually gave me pretty free reign, and I was that was refreshing because I had tried to include Lincoln in another book, and they said, absolutely not. It can't sell with a, with an attack on Lincoln. And so when I pitched this book, uh, they said, we're fine with Lincoln. Go for it, because they're trying to appeal to a different audience, I think. 
and um, they want a libertarian audience is what they're going for. But um, they had no qualms about me putting Lincoln or Nixon or the Bushes in the Obama chapter. I've got both George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush in that chapter. They had no problem with that. Or Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, I mean, this is this is surprising because for years they had uh, they had blocked those. It was it was um, it was refreshing to be able to just write whatever I wanted to write for them. Yeah, absolutely. That's wonderful. All right, let's talk about. Even though you are primarily a 19th century historian and a Southern historian, at the same time you've done a lot of work in a lot of areas. I mean, you've done a lot of you've done obviously constitutional stuff. You've done founding fathers stuff. So you're quite versatile. But here you're also talking about 20th century history, which I find very interesting. So I'm going to choose one now, and I choose Harry Truman. I want the Brian McClanahan version. <laughs> All right. Well, Harry Truman. You know, Harry Truman is an interesting guy. I think, you know, there's, there's some things to like about Harry Truman. I'll say that as a person. Uh, there are some things to like about him. He was kind of this middle class, you know, uh, underdog kind of story, and we like that in American politics. You know, a guy that was the haberdasher, he loses his business, uh, and then he becomes somebody, right? So we think, oh, that's really refreshing. But when you read what he said about stuff, you think to yourself, this guy is a is a is a megaloman. He's a he's a maniac, right? I mean, he he's uh, he's out there saying it. He wrote his, his, a letter to his daughter saying, well, you know what? If I had all the money in the world. I'm not going to buy, uh, you know, houses and cars. I'm going to buy votes. <laughs> Come on. Uh, so he's this he's this uh, guy that, that gets into power. And, of course, as president, he's essentially going to ride, you know, Roosevelt's coattails uh, into vice presidency. And then, of course, as president, um, he's going to essentially take Roosevelt's second Bill of Rights and implement it, or at least try, through what's often called the fair deal. Uh, so uh, Truman's going to go out and push for things that we would recognize today, whether it's uh, national health care, uh, you know, a, a higher minimum wage, all things that are completely unconstitutional, which uh, thankfully at the time, uh, you know, none of this stuff was implemented, but of course it has been since, you know, we've got Obamacare and all these things. Uh, but Truman was definitely pushing a legislative agenda that uh, Roosevelt would have recognized. Now, the things, of course, that Truman gets uh, a lot of um, credit for, I think, are the things that we should also vilify him for. And one of those things is the Korean War, which he gets involved in completely unconstitutionally. Right? I mean, Truman goes out and essentially gets the United States involved in war. It's the first war that the U.S. has been involved in that's not a declared war. So we're going to invade Korea all for the United Nations. In fact, he has this very strange address where he says, you know, we have to get involved in the Korean War because uh, we're worried about the impact of, of North Korea on the future of the United States security. Right, so we had, I guess it's all those North Korean bombers that were flying overhead at the time that we had to worry about uh, at that particular point. But we're going to get involved in this war that's a complete disaster uh, for the United States, uh, for the Constitution and executive power. And then, of course, you get things uh, moving forward where you have the creation of uh, the, the creation of the CIA and you get the Dulles brothers and all the other things that come out of that. So we get domestic spying. But, I mean, Truman is a disaster. That doesn't even include his, his attempt and his to nationalize the steel industry. Uh, he talked about, he did it once and talked about it before that. He wanted to hang steel workers. He wanted to put them in the army and hang them uh, because they were, they were, had the gall to, uh, to uh, oppose um, the, the federal government policies uh, and were on strike. So, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, just crazy stuff that was going on here in the Truman administration. Yeah, we and uh, Kevin and I, I, I think of the three of us as being kind of a trio in some ways. And Kevin and I wrote, I'm talking about Kevin Gutzman, uh, we wrote a chapter on that whole uh, steel mill fiasco in uh, Who Killed the Constitution. Right. All right, so, so, so Truman, Truman is just, there are so many areas in which Truman is bad, and yet he's still, I remember back in 1988, this is the, the, Almost the first campaign I followed closely. I, oddly enough, when I was 12, I did actually follow Reagan versus Mondale in 84 pretty closely, especially for a 12-year-old. But I remember Mike Dukakis and, uh, and uh, George H.W. Bush, each one of them in 1988 was posing – as Harry Truman. They were both <laughs> trying to say, we're just like Harry Truman in one way or another. And of course, this is extremely bizarre because when Truman left office, he had the lowest approval rating of any president, including Nixon at the time of his resignation. Why would you compete for that designation? Right. I ask rhetorically. Yeah, I, I don't know. And you know, a lot of, one other thing about Truman that people don't realize, but you know, when we had the creation of Medicare, uh, he and Bess were the first two to sign up for it. 
so here we have, you know, the Great Society and Johnson. They're the first two to get their Medicare card, right? So, um, you know, great. Uh, <laughs> of course they're going to do that because <laughs> they love that that second Bill of Rights and, and this expansion of unconstitutional government programs. But I, I don't I don't understand the fascination with Truman. Uh, I can from the left because, I mean, he's their guy. Uh, I mean, it, this guy was was putting these the second Bill of Rights into effect. And now you can trace every Democrat talking point, every leftist talking point back to that period, and you find where it comes from. I mean, Truman cut his teeth during the Roosevelt administration. So I understand, uh, you know, the, the infatuation with Truman on that side. But ours, uh, on, the, on the right, I, I just don't see it. Uh, it's just it's hilarious to me. You know, I, l- let's say something about Barack Obama, if you don't mind, because I almost never talk about him on the show. If you look back, this is episode 591, and of course, Brian's book, uh, is going to be linked there, tomwoods.com slash 591. So I, I recommend you read it. You're going to learn something. Even if you think you're an old hand at this, you are going to learn something. I always learn something from Brian. But you look back at those 591 episodes, there's not that – I mean, okay, we talk about Obamacare, I suppose, and we've talked about the stimulus. But given the almost crazed obsession with Obama that I see in the right-wing media – there's surprisingly little on the show about him, mainly because I just think it's so obvious that that's just not fun for me. I, I want to, I want something that's more of a challenge, you know. So, but yet I still feel like I, I have some obligation to talk about him. So you are unfortunately the guinea pig who has to do this for me. So you've got to summarize what what are the good reasons to be against Obama. I mean, a, a good reason to be against Obama is not that he's a secret Muslim, <laughs> if you ask me. Because I, I'm sorry, but I, I don't know a whole lot of Muslims who are promoting gay marriage and putting a, you know, want to put a rainbow flag image up on the White House. I, I'm not seeing that, so I, I, you know, I, I don't go for that. I, th- I mean, he, he holds progressive leftist social views down the line, all of which are incompatible with Islam, I mean, of all things to criticize the guy for, it just seems like well, you don't have to reach for controversial claims about his background. He's handing right. you material. Every day right. he's handing you material, and right. they have to dig into his past, and, well, he grew up over here, and he had this influence. No, okay, yeah, if we had 10 lifetimes, we could get to that stuff. But he's handing you material. Name me some things that he's handed us that we should be upset about. Well, sure. I mean, one of the things about the book is, you know, one of the one of the pitches for the book is it didn't start with Obama, and I think that's the problem. People think, oh my gosh, Obama's just the first I president know. of American history, and it's been. So, if we just had George W. Bush back, right, it'd be so good. Uh, well, you know, Obama is awful for so many reasons. First of all, you've got a president who refuses to execute laws that have been passed. Now, I mean, in some ways, I could say, well, this is actually a good thing by refusing to execute the Obamacare legislation. We were saved from that for a while, but we know why he was doing it for political reasons. So you've got that. Of course, the president is constitutionally required to enforce the laws, uh, and he says that law is constitutional, so hey, he's got to enforce it. Uh, But you also have the excessive use of signing statements and executive orders. I mean, these things... Of course, something that goes back way I mean, before Obama, but he's doing it just like every other predecessor of, uh, before him did it and uh, using executive orders to legislate from the executive office. Uh, you've got the non-recess recess appointments uh, where he just says, look, the Congress is in recess. So I'm going to appoint this this guy. Uh, and of course, we know that was unconstitutional, and illegal. Uh, you've got the bombing campaign in Syria where he had no congressional authorization to do this. So Obama, he hands you things all the time to say, well, here we have executive abuse. Uh, we've got an elected king, uh, but of course, everyone focuses on the fact that maybe he wasn't born in the United States or maybe he's a Muslim. I mean, all this stuff that's just kind of silly at the end of the day. There's too much to talk about Obama uh, to say that, you know, a- as you said, to-, to criticize his past or his background. We've got a president that doesn't follow the Constitution. And the funny thing is, every time he says, well, you know, I taught a little constitutional law. <laughs> I have to laugh because what I, I, I well it's indicative of, of law schools. They don't really teach the Constitution. They teach case law over and over again. Right. So you just find all these Supreme Court decisions or federal court decisions that back up what you're doing, and hey, you're good to go there. Uh, and uh, who cares what the original Constitution says? It's all about what the, the judicial system has said in relation to uh, this particular law and how they're going to pat themselves on the back and make it legal somehow. Now, I— by the way, I have no problem with people who are interested in, for instance, what his intellectual influences have been and the circles that he's traveled in. I mean, that that is interesting stuff. 
But as I say, the more arcane discussions of, uh, again, whether he's a Muslim, I mean, really, uh, of, I, I just, I cannot get over this, especially when his foreign policy is basically, you know, although maybe 10% less friendly to Israel than other presidents, <laughs> it's basically nothing other than mainstream bipartisan U.S. foreign policy. There's nothing particularly different about it. Uh, he's somewhat less bellicose in some ways, but other than that, I, I don't see any real b big difference. So my, my question to you is, as you go through these criticisms of Obama, and there are things like, uh, you know, as you say, the appointments, the, the, the non-recess, recess appointments, and bombing without getting congressional authorization, how many of those things, though, are things that other presidents didn't do? How, how many of these things are unique to Obama? Nothing. And now I think yeah. we'll get to the reason that they don't really want to talk about what he's doing. Yeah, nothing. There's nothing yeah. unique to Obama there. So, I mean, this is, and, and actually in that chapter, I say, look, for the last 28 years, we've suffered essentially under the Barack Obama administration, it, which is true. Uh, you go back to George H.W. Bush and, and you look at the Gulf War. I mean, he actually said he did not need to, uh, to, to notify Congress of what he was doing. He just gave him a courtesy call. Now, that is preposterous. Uh, you know, so I'm just going to go and go to war with Iraq, but I don't really need to consult Congress on that. I mean, this is absolutely crazy. Uh, and of course, the H.W. Bush administration, you get the Americans with Disabilities Act, you get uh, the attempt to uh, use the executive branch for uh, federal uh, gun grab. Uh, you have all the things that, of course, we could, if, if, it, if you just put Barack Obama there, you just substitute George H.W. Bush for, Obama, for Barack Obama, people would be going absolutely nuts over this. But because it's a Republican, oh, well, that's okay. We can't really criticize him for that. Uh, and same thing with George W. Bush. So uh, none of the things that Obama has done are uh, unique to the Obama administration. And I think that's the major problem with the executive branch and how far we've gotten off of the original executive that was sold to the states in 1788. Yeah, this is so – I think this is why they don't want to get to the substance of it because, of course, their own people have done all these things. Now, on the other hand, you can talk about the stimulus, which, of course, is just a, a variant of the George Bush stimulus, although uh, on a larger scale. And you could talk about Obamacare, which is a large-scale intervention, although it's built on – the idea of the individual mandate that comes right out of the Heritage Foundation and Newt Gingrich. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, th th you, you're exactly right. The, 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 what Obama exposes is that there is a hypocrisy in the quote-unquote American right. Which no, is that, there isn't. I don't. I refuse to believe that, Brian. You, you're telling me these people are hypocrites. Well, I mean, uh, no, I, I, no, I don't really believe that. <laughs> but yeah, there's a hypocrisy of the American right, and I think this is this is the nature of you know mainstream quote unquote conservatism, and what that actually is. It's just a slightly less intrusive big government. I mean, or it's a variation of it. We want to use big government to do these things, but not these things. Uh, but big government's fine. It's great. We love it for these things. And so uh, this is why uh, – and what's interesting, though, is that you know, when I've been doing the interviews for this, for this book, there are people that agree with me. Hey, we need to hold our people's feet to the fire just as much as Obama. Oh, yeah, I think Americans are starting – are finally waking up to this. They're starting to realize it, but it's taking some time, and this is why I'm always so positive about things. Things are changing in America, and, I, and it wasn't like this 20 years ago. Think back to, to 1994 when the Republicans took Congress, and I was caught up in that too. Oh, yes, so many things are going to change. We got the Congress. You know, we're going to go in and we're going to – we have this contract with, you know, for America. We're going to go in and change things. And then you get a whole bunch of crickets, right? And nothing happens. Oh, yeah. I, I even remember there, there, the, the media was, of course, caught up in this. I mean, both sides collude in this. The, the right wing so-called uh, wants to claim that everything's going to change so that they can get more donor money from suckers. And the media, of course, wants to play it up because that's just who they are. And plus, even when there's a tiny, tiny, tiny change, the media wants to make it sound like it's catastrophic. <laughs> and they even were talking about, they, I guess Dick Armey in an, in an unguarded moment had said something about privatizing the post office. Right. I mean, that was how radical it seemed. Like th things were really going to start happening in 1994. So I'm saying that, Brian, so people don't think that you were just terminally naive at that time. It wasn't totally crazy to think that way. It really wasn't. Well, no, and I mean, but as soon as as soon as it all didn't happen, I think that's I think that was really a turning point in some ways. Now people started thinking about maybe mainstream Republicans when all that stuff didn't happen by the late '90s, uh, and then of course the Bush administration. Again, people think, oh yeah, here we go, we got our guy, and then look what happens. 
Um, so I think this was a real turning point for a lot of people, particularly younger people about our age. We really saw this firsthand uh, where we were excited about some things and then we got nothing. Right. So uh, wh- what do we go? Where do we go from here? Uh, and, and and I think that's why everyone's turning against the establishment at a, at a particular age in life. They're saying the establishment does not represent us. This is why so many young people were attracted to Ron Paul, uh, because it was something different. It really was something different. And Paul walked the walk. So you wanted somebody like that, not an establishment conservative, quote unquote conservative, who wasn't going to do anything. And you bring up Heritage Foundation. A lot of these groups don't want change to happen because if change happens, then they can't raise money. I mean, think about it. If some of these things were actually to happen, then they can't go out and say, well, we got to raise money tomorrow because, you know, we need to fight big government. We need to fight Barack Obama. Well, let's say they let's say they undid Obamacare. Well, then they can't raise money in undoing Obamacare anymore. So they actually lose money by actually affecting real change and Voila, their coffers go dry. So I think that's a problem with the establishment. They can't make money if things actually do change in Washington, D.C. They got to have the constant threat of that big, you know, evil out there that they have to rail against that they never want to change in the first place. Before we go on, I want to uh, tell people about the special deal we're doing here because I want to give away free autographed copies of, of Brian's book. And t- tell them the title once again, the full title with the subtitle. Sure. It's Nine Presidents Who Screwed Up America and Four Who Tried to Save Her. All right. You're going to get a free autographed copy of that book, but uh, with a subscription to our libertyclassroom.com website because Brian is going to be unveiling in the coming days a brand new course on the U.S. presidency, and it's going to be just fantastic. This ain't nothing like what they taught you in school at all. And at this point, I've given up keeping count of how many courses we have at Liberty Class. And this will either be number 16, 17. I don't know what it is, but it's a ridiculous deal. It's shocking, all the stuff you get. And don't you don't ever have to worry about ever losing another debate. Okay, You don't have to be like poor Michael Malice trying to debate Alexander Hamilton. That's not going to happen to you. Okay, <laughs> First of all, you're going to have the good sense not to try to argue in favor of Alexander Hamilton. But secondly, you're going to have a ton of knowledge that you can get on the go anytime you want to learn. So here's the deal. You sign up for libertyclassroom.com at any of our levels, and you just drop me a line. And you figure out how to drop me a line. Look for me. I'm at tomwoods.com. You drop me a line through there, and you say, send me my book, you bum. Give me your address, and I'll have Brian autograph a book and send it to you. But you have limited time here. Let's see. Brian and I, this episode is going live Thursday, February 11th, 2016. I am going to be super, super generous and say you have until uh, Tuesday, February 16th, 2016 to grab a membership at libertyclassroom.com and get your free book. And then that is it. If you write asking for your free book after that, I say, look, I don't even know. You must be some crazy lunatic because I don't even know what free book offer you're talking about. So you've got to grab this right away. Check it out, libertyclassroom.com. And you can use the coupons at the same time. we got coupons at libertyclassroom.com slash coupons. So you can use a coupon, get a discount, and get a free book. It's, it's ridiculous. It's so ridiculous, I can't even keep talking about it. Brian, let's talk about one of your alleged good presidents. I am skeptical, but I am willing to listen. Let's see. I know you want to talk about John Tyler just because I know you. I've known you for a long time, and I know that of those four, you would most like to talk about John Tyler. Am I wrong? Th- that's correct. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let me give you an—I mean, you have to get a 19th century figure in here. So let's talk about John Tyler. What makes him so great? Well, John Tyler, I call the greatest president in American history for the simple reason that here's a guy that, that assumed office, right? The first president to assume office after William Henry Harrison kicks the bucket, and he comes in, and you have the Whigs just exuberant about the fact they've taken Congress, they've got the executive branch, they're really going to get their, their agenda through— but they didn't think about John Tyler and who he actually was. This is a guy that cut his teeth at the table with Thomas Jefferson. And so he's a Jeffersonian. His father was, was very good friends with Thomas Jefferson. And he, had, he was the guy that gave the one speech against the force bill uh, when Andrew Jackson was trying to get that ran through Congress. So he was a states rights Democrat. And uh, but he, he becomes a Whig because of the nullification controversy in South Carolina. He can't he can't support the Democrats anymore. So he comes into office and the Whigs have a meeting with him, the cabinet. And they say, look, Tyler, here's what's going to happen. You're going to 
going to rubber stamp all our legislation uh, because we're going to run the show and you're just going to do what we say. And Tyler says, no, no, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm the president. If you don't like it, you can resign. So um, they start passing all this legislation through the Congress. They're going to recharter or they're going to get a new charter for a third bank of the United States. They're going to get uh, federally funded internal improvements. They're going to start pushing for higher tariffs. And Tyler vetoes everything. In fact, Henry Clay, who was behind all this legislation, gets so angry. He goes to the, to the White House, which they call the executive mansion, goes to the White House, and he gets in a heated argument with Tyler. And Tyler basically just lets him have it. He says, look, uh, I'm here. I'm in the executive branch. I'm going to do what I have to do, my job. You go back to the Capitol and you do what you have to do. But understand that essentially I'm going to veto everything that's unconstitutional. And they never spoke again. And in Tyler's veto messages, he actually wrote in one of the veto messages on the on the rechartering of the bank, the second bill that came before him, that he has a duty to preserve, protect and defend the Constitution. And because of that, he has to veto unconstitutional legislation. And so this is quite refreshing. You have an independent executive who's not worried about his own reputation or his party because the Whigs would kick him out of the party for this. Uh, and he's doing what he needs to do to protect the Constitution. So I think Tyler doesn't get enough respect or uh, admiration from people. He really was doing what he had to do to preserve the original Constitution, and that's why I call him the greatest president in American history. Before I let you go, Brian, I want to ask you this. Suppose, I mean, I, I know it's obvious if if I were reading a book by on the presidency by Doris Kearns Goodwin. I know which presidents she'd choose as the good ones, all the ones that you choose as the bad ones, you know, maybe with the exception <laughs> of Nixon. I already know that. But what if I read a book on the presidency that was put together by, I hate to pick on the Heritage Foundation. Actually, why did I say that? I, I don't hate to pick on the Heritage Foundation. Suppose the Heritage Foundation put together a book on the presidency. What would I read there? How would it be different from yours, and how would it be different from Doris Kearns Goodwin? Well, I think it would be almost similar to Doris Kearns Goodwin. Uh, the only difference you would have is that maybe you would get someone like Ronald Reagan and the Good Ones, uh, but you would definitely see Lincoln. You'd probably even see FDR because of his activities during World War II. I mean, he, he is revered by conservatives, many conservatives, because he won World War II, uh, theoretically. So you would see Teddy Roosevelt in that list on, on, a, on a Heritage Foundation list. Uh, you would, you know, so you would see the people that um, that Goodwin would pick. I think the only difference is maybe the Heritage Foundation would not include, uh, you know, Johnson. Goodwin might include Johnson. Uh, maybe they wouldn't include Truman. Go you know, Goodwin might include that. But uh, I'm what I've done is essentially flip the entire ranking system on its head. And you mentioned the classes coming up. When you get that one, the the ten presidents that I picked that are the good guys. You're gonna. Those are all, as I call them. Those are the catfish. Of, they're the bottom feeders of the uh, of the presidential uh, ranking system. And these guys are the worst of the worst, according to to modern rankings. But they're usually pretty good because what they're doing is actually adhering to their oath. The guys that are always the best are the ones that didn't do a very good job with that. So uh, you would find that there's a lot of similarities between those on the left and the right, and who they pick for the good guys. Uh, in contrast to the ones that I pick, which I, I actually had somebody tell me, uh, well, I like your book, but uh, I don't like the fact that you put Jefferson T and Tyler uh, in as the good guys, and I don't like the fact you put Lincoln and Roosevelt and Nixon in as the bad guys. So essentially, it's very partisan. Um, you know, they 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 didn't like uh, that I'm picking on Republicans, and I've elevated these quote unquote Democrats, uh, at least in their mind, uh, to a to a revered position. They, they just can't see past the R and the D. All right. So remember, everybody. We're going to give you a free copy of Brian's book if you join libertyclassroom.com by Tuesday. You only have till Tuesday, February 16th, and you know you're going to forget to do it. So do it right now, then just drop us a line. There's a contact page there or on my site, and let us know you want the book. So once again, Brian, tell them the title. Nine Presidents Who Screwed Up America and Four Who Tried to Save Her. And if you want the free book, tell Tom you want it personalized. I'll even sign it over to you with your name on it. Uh, so uh, I mean, come on, yeah. right? <laughs> Plus, we got coupon. I'll have I'll have the whole offer spelled out on the show notes page. If this is too much for you to comprehend that you're getting a discount and a free book, I'll have it all spelled out at tomwoods.com slash 591, as, as well as a link directly to Brian's book that you can get uh, if you just want to buy his book. Uh, go right ahead and do that. We strongly encourage that. All right, Brian, best of luck promoting the book, and um, I can't wait to get your new course up in the coming days. It's going to be great, and uh, best of luck with the promotion. Well, thanks a lot, Tom. Appreciate you having me on. All right, before I tell you about tomorrow, let's see what's going on here. Let's see. 
Well, we got, don't forget, don't forget, you have advance information from me. I mean, this is the sort of thing I could go to jail for, right? This is inside information I'm giving you people, and it's about the 60% off deal at Rocket Languages. It starts at midnight. When it goes into February 12th at midnight, 12.01 a.m., February 12th, 2016, you can start getting courses at Rocket Languages at 60% off, but it's only for the first 750, and they go really fast. So you've got to set your Google Calendar. You've got to be ruthless you got to forget about those people who, you know, they're going to wake up at 9 in the morning and do it. No, 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 no. You're going to wait till midnight, 12.01. You're going to snag your free course using coupon code VALENTINES in all caps over at TomWoods.com slash ROCKET. Remember our cruise. Bob Murphy and I are hosting a cruise seven days at sea with Tom Woods and Bob Murphy. That's either a terrible, terrible ordeal, a punishment of some kind, or it's great fun. And the only way to find out is by attending. You can check that out at ContraCruise.com. That's later this year in 2016. And then let's talk about what's coming up tomorrow. Stefan Kinsella is coming back to the show, and we're just going to, we got a smorgasbord of libertarian topics that we're going to make sense of, and it's always fun and educational when we get to talk to Stefan. So tune in tomorrow. We'll see you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.